thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? <laughs> well, okay, uh, and thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to give this talk. So, uh, yeah, the topic of my talk is um, this, uh, the idea of going towards high fidelity numerical simulations, in particular for proplanetary disks. Um, so, I start with a picture uh, where in uh, here there's an observation of a proplanetary disk, and um, <clears throat> on these sides there's a simulation trying to reproduce this uh, proplanetary disk. Um, so, the idea is that uh, because there are still a lot of unknowns on how planets form, and I just looked up some uh, recent papers in Nature to to give get these questions. Uh, what is often done, and you've seen throughout this whole uh, morning, is that uh, we do numerical simulations. Um, so this is a bit confusing. Okay. Ah, okay. So, at the lowest level of complexity, we can represent our system as a hydrodynamic system, actually. So, uh, where in the center you have a star, which is given by a gravity source term, and around the star you have a uh, gas which is orbiting. Uh, but this can actually be hard to evolve numerically depending on the constraints that you have. So, for instance, if you want to use a code which is general and not only designed to evolve disks, so for instance, think of uh, unstructured meshes or Christian um, <clears throat> grid codes, then uh, it's actually pretty hard to do this uh, in a naive fashion. So here I show you just a simple example where we have a, the cold Keplerian disk case. So here it's just a density profile. You have uh, high densities and low density, and at the center you have the star. And what happens is that as you evolve this, with each rotation you'll, uh, your solution um, diffuses because of a uh, numerical viscosity and after a few rotations this will break down and uh, you can what you can do is now increase the resolution but this still will happen um, because of numerical viscosity so you can improve your by uh, doing two things so one thing is to go just to higher order methods and another thing is to account for the structure of the PD so you know something about your system and you can introduce this information into your solver. And this is also uh, something that I'll discuss in this talk. So <clears throat> I give you the outline of the talk. So first I'll just mention the mathematical model which is used. Uh, then I'll talk about this uh, high order final element discretization which is discontinuous Galerkin. Um, then I'll talk about well-balanced property and angular momentum conservation. And then I'll show some numerical experiments and go into conclusions and what we are doing. So, <clears throat> like I mentioned, the, the model, it, in the, t if you approximate your problem uh, to the lowest level of complexity, you can think of this as being a hydrodynamic system. And this is basically just given by Euler equations um, plus a gravity source term. So this is actually a hyperbolic balance law. And if we stay in, in two dimensions, you have uh, the quantities that we are tracking and evolving are the um, density, the momentum, and the energy. And we, the fluxes give us the dynamics of the system, and this, uh, this gives you the gravity interaction. <clears throat> and of course, we close the system with the uh, equation of states, and throughout these uh, these simulations that I'll show, we use the ideal gas law. So going on to these uh, high order final, finite element discretizations, uh, just a quick word on this. The idea is that you want to converge to your solution uh, quickly. So just uh, <clears throat> a simple definition. So as you increase the number of cells in your uh, simulation, you want to attain a convergence rate which is higher than one. So in the CFD community, normally a high order method is considered uh, when you have a convergence rate of uh, larger than two. Um, 
so <clears throat> because we are dealing with uh, hyperbolic problems, uh, I'll show you the formulation of the discontinuous Galerkin method. This was introduced in 98 by Copern. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a simple um, 1D example. So you go from a domain omega, and first you have to discretize this. So we put a tessellation, a Cartesian tessellation, and we call it TH. And now we are seeking for a solution which is going to be high order, uh, which lives in this space. And this essentially means that it's a globally discontinuous solution, but that locally is approximated with a polynomial of at most degree k. <clears throat> And now to, to solve this, we have to approximate our solution. Uh, to approximate our solution, we need the weak formulation. So uh, we take a test function v, and uh, we multiply it through with our PDE, and we integrate over some cell k. <clears throat> and now if we just um, rewrite the divergence, uh, using divergence theorem, you get two contributions, um, <clears throat> which is basically the flux through the cell, cell surfaces, and then a, a, <clears throat> a volume integral. Uh, and the important thing to take from, from this is that if you want to go to higher order in this case, you basically just need to project your solution into a space uh, which has uh, higher order polynomials. And in terms of the stencil, you don't really change it by going to high order. So you always only take information from your neighbors. And this is important because if you want to parallelize, then you have a very local stencil. So further on, to actually uh, solve this numerically, you have to then replace your integrals uh, with quadrature forms uh, and disambiguate the value at the interfaces. So use uh, Riemann solvers or approximate Riemann solvers. And in the end, we have this numerical scheme. And this is what we use. So now onto the properties of the PDE. So uh, Clement already talked about uh, well-balanced schemes. So the idea is that if you, if your system can uh, has a steady state, so if W is a steady state solution of your PDE system, you don't want to evolve it, evolve it numerically. You want your solver to not do anything. Uh, but here, this from a bachelor thesis in our institute, you, what you see is that if you just use some <clears throat> scheme which is unbalanced, over time you will start deviating from the steady states. Um, so this is just the one definition that I think it's important. So if we recast any numerical scheme can be written in this form, so uh, explicit numerical scheme, you have your solution at uh, t plus, plus one, n plus one is given by your solution at the previous time step plus some update function. And now a well-balanced scheme is going to be um, such that h will be zero if you have a steady state solution. So you don't do any updates. And there's a formal definition given by Paris in 2006. Um, some more definitions just for the for the sake of discussion in the results. This is just essentially first, um, by definition also, if you have a steady state solution, uh, we, this W will follow, will satisfy this relation, uh, which is the balance of the divergence and the source term. <clears throat> uh, further on, uh, if we look at the specific Euler equations, uh, first, a hydrostatic steady state uh, is given by this relation. So here we note that there's no, uh, so the velocity is going to be zero. So what, what we have to balance is the gradient of the pressure and the gradient of some potential. And then, uh, but in astrophysics actually, it's probably more in, in, important to, to assume that your velocity is not going to be trivial. So. Uh, in the astrophysics literature, I found this term, dynamic equilibrium, where you can't really assume that your velocity is going to be zero. And this is uh, something which is harder to maintain numerically. Um, and actually, in a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, research done for shallow water equations, which assume this type of uh, equilibrium. 
uh, whereas for something which is a bit more complicated, there's not so much uh, research on it yet. Um, so <clears throat> I present uh, one formulation that we did, which is the well-balanced Kunga-Kuta DG scheme. Uh, and we followed um, <clears throat> what is done by Dendner in 2011. So the idea is that we represent the solution in terms of the equilibrium plus some perturbation. And uh, using the first definition that I show you, we can basically rewrite our scheme to be the <clears throat> evolution in terms of the perturbation. <clears throat> so uh, we have, we approximate the perturbation with high order. Um, <clears throat> and we don't make any assumptions on the type of equilibrium. However, we do require to know the exact form of the steady state, which seems to be a very big caveat, but <clears throat> in some problems we actually have access to this. So, and the last uh, part, uh, theoretical part of my talk is this angular momentum conservation. So, um, <clears throat> if we look at the Euler system, uh, you can derive also the conservation law for angular momentum, but this is not really preserved uh, numerically because as I showed you, I, <clears throat> we evolved the, the density, the momentum and the energy. So it would be nice to have a way to also fulfill this uh, conservation law because it's part of the system. So actually in 2015, Charles shows that with DG uh, methods, um, we can attain also, so we can fulfill this additional PDE uh, for the angular momentum, <clears throat> uh, but this has several constraints. So first, it depends in the test and tr trial space chosen, so in these uh, test functions, and also the smoothness of the solution matters because once you start doing limiting, uh, if you look at this derivation, this, um, <clears throat> this basically using the fact that the test functions are not limited. And also it assumes that the order of the scheme has to be at least greater than one. So it has some, um, th there are some constraints and this is something that we're also working on uh, making a more general approach to angular momentum conservation. So <clears throat> before I go onto the code, uh, onto the results, I'll just describe uh, the code that we use uh, for these simulations. So we have several models implemented. Uh, so advection burgers, Euler, and monitor hydrodynamics. <clears throat> um, we have a CPU and a GPU implementation, which has been done by one of our club writers, David Velasco. Um, with the GPU implementation, we have a good speed up, which means that now we, it's actually tractable to solve these DG schemes. We are also able to run over multiple GPUs. Uh, so now I'll just go on to the results. So here I'm showing you a 2D ribbon problem, <clears throat> and this is just the initial condition, and I'm plotting the density. So you have um, a region of high density, and what will happen is that over time you'll develop a shock and we want to see whether we can capture this well. So if you use a first order scheme um, with 128 by 128 grids, uh, you, all the features are very smudged, you won't be able to see much. If you pump up the resolution, you'll be able to see the features emerging. Uh, but this is at a higher cost. If you want to maintain the resolution, uh, but you go to higher order, you can now see the shock fronts and the features developing very clearly. <clears throat> so going back to this uh, coupler in this case, um, we can also, so just to show again, the idea is that if we increase the resolution again, we, we can solve it for a bit longer, but eventually we'll also diffuse. Now with the uh, second order and third order schemes, in, uh, with DG, we can keep the resolution relatively low, lower, and uh, evolve the, the system for, about, for a lot longer, and uh, the structure of the disk looks still okay. There are some oscillations coming, and this is due to discontinuities at the interface of the density. <clears throat> so now, to talk about this well-balanced property, this is 
uh, first the hydrostatic steady state. So it's just basically a exponential um, <clears throat> exponential profile, and it's hydrostatic, so we don't have any velocities. And this eta here is to denote the perturbation. But here, first the results uh, we assume eta to be zero. And what we can see is that if you increase the resolution uh, for an unbalanced scheme <clears throat> uh, and you increase the order, eventually you can get to, you can approximate the steady state very well, but this is at a high cost. Whereas if you have a well-balanced scheme, you, you're really not dependent on the order and you can still uh, be close, uh, very close to the steady state, to machine precision. Um, so now we introduce a perturbation. So this eta now give, is given by a Gaussian pulse. And uh, I show you different amplitudes. I'm not sure if this is, you can see this. But so this is the amplitude of the perturbation. So this is 10 to the minus 2. And what I plot here is the difference between the full solution and the steady state. So this is the initial condition, and this is after uh, some time. And for, for a perturbation which is large, uh, the well-balanced scheme and the non-well-balanced scheme perform very similarly. But if you start reducing the size of, the, of your perturbation, now the non-well-balanced scheme will start deviating and is not able to capture it so well. So you can play this game of now inc increasing the order of your scheme or the resolution to capture this perturbation. But uh, if you keep now reducing the amplitude, you'll end up, <clears throat> you, you always have to increase the approximation, uh, the spatial approximation of your scheme. Whereas with the well-balanced scheme, this really doesn't matter the size of the amplitude. Um, so now looking at something which is a bit more complicated, so this dynamic steady state that I described, uh, here we assume a constant density profile with tapering off and a subcoplarian uh, velocity. And what you can see here is that um, it becomes harder to, to maintain this equilibrium if you have an unbalanced scheme. Whereas with a well-balanced scheme, you can still be very close to, to the steady state. So now <clears throat> we can think again, okay, what happens if we add a perturbation? So we add a perturbation to, to the gravity potential, and you could think of this as being, for instance, a planet. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that here I'm plotting the densities and the difference between uh, the, the full solution and the steady state. So in a non-well-balanced scheme, you'll have some oscillations coming uh, from just solving the steady state. Whereas if you have a well-balanced scheme, again, you can see the trajectory of this perturber a lot better. So, <clears throat> and now for the last set of results, I'll talk about this uh, angular momentum conservation. <laughs> right, thanks. Uh, so I take the Grosha vortex, which is a rotating steady state for inviscid Euler, and uh, we have the form for the uh, orbital velocity and pressure. Uh, and we can also derive the vorticity and angular momentum easily from this. Uh, so <clears throat> I found a paper by Vendroff from 2003 where they compare a lot of different schemes <clears throat> and how well they can capture uh, the vorticity. And I compare it to our DG second order scheme and third uh, DG third order scheme. So there's one important thing <clears throat> that I want to mention. So Veno in this paper is actually a fifth order uh, method and uh, still doesn't do very well. <clears throat> Whereas some other methods, for instance, PPM does pretty well um, to, to capture this uh, vorticity. Just one last uh, comparison. So this is a code from 2014 where they use um, constraint transport upwinds methods and uh, PPM reconstruction, uh, and we compare the reconstruction of the uh, <clears throat> orbital velocity, of the pressure, and of the vorticity. So th these are the results from the paper uh, from 2014, and this is the DG results. And we, we can track the vorticity pretty well. So the, the blue curve is given by the third order method. Uh, so. <clears throat> 
these are my conclusions. So first, higher order methods, uh, we can get a better resolution for the same space resolution. Um, also, we hope that with higher order methods, we can have less tailor-made solutions, which means that uh, the codes can be more general and tackle a big variety of problems without having to make codes which are very specific. <clears throat> uh, however, one of the results that we got from the well-balanced study is that naively just going to higher order might not be good enough. So it's always good if we know something about our system to try to exploit the properties of the system. So if we know that it's close to a steady state. And then uh, something that I found useful, uh, but that it was hard to find was some, uh, some benchmarks to test some of these properties are not uh, very well known. So I think there's space for the study of analytical solutions. And in addition, we have a code which has an efficient implementation, has this well-balanced correction. Um, <clears throat> and we have some analytical solutions to benchmark the code. Uh, so the working progress that we have now is basically, I think it would be interesting to be able to extend this well-balanced scheme to uh, arbitrarily unknown equilibrium without having these harsh constraints and also uh, to more general angular momentum preserving property schemes. We're also working on uh, extending our model to MHD, and this requires the treatment of this divergence free uh, property of the magnetic field, and this extension to high order is, is something that we're looking at. And the last point is something which is uh, personally interesting for me, which is the <clears throat> the way to ex find analytic analytical solutions to benchmark codes, uh, which are multidimensional and have certain properties that we want to make sure that our codes can uh, fulfill. So, so this is just some comment on this validation, but I think I don't have enough time. So I'll just leave a summary of my talk. So the idea, is that uh, higher order methods seem to be a very popular tool and pretty much the next generation methods in astrophysics, but uh, going to higher order naively might not be really good enough. Uh, so it's also good to know something about the system and introduce these uh, structure preserving properties. So thank you. I'll leave this up here. Thank you, Maya. If you have any questions. Can you say maybe a little bit more on the structures you were forming in this disk, which was your, one of your test calculations? You were forming these rings in there, so. Uh, uh, in the cold Keplerian disk? I think so. Yes, um, so the rings, so the, these rings are, um, this is really coming, this is coming from the approximation um, with a higher order approximation because we are approximating a discontinuous function. So this is actually, um, it's something that we need to, to work on because um, when you approximate a discontinuous function with high order, you get this Gibbs phenomenon at near the discontinuity. So this is something which needs to be treated via limiters, for instance. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Excuse me? What was the disc, what, what discontinuity were you trying to capture here? Oh, th this is a, a test case that we found which has been used to benchmark other codes. So we just used it to see how, how this method would perform. So was the discontinuity at the edge of the disc and then worked its way in to make, yeah, so, make these rings? Yeah, so what starts happening <clears throat> is here, um, at the, yeah, so you have the discontinuity here and here, and uh, you'll start having some oscillations there, and that propagates inwards. But the, these really, <clears throat> if you just look at, um, for instance, <clears throat> the advection of a, of a square pulse, this, this happens if you don't do any limiting. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is something that it's, uh, in my opinion, one problem of discontinuous Galerkin, which has not been yet solved which is how to effectively treat these discontinuities. 
So some people actually do, I think there was a talk here where they added some viscosity to get rid of these uh, oscillations. <clears throat> Questions? Yeah. Did you try to couple the discontinuous galerky with the wild balance scheme? Uh, yes, yes. So, um, so that's the so the derivation I showed briefly. So this uh, well balanced Hungakuta DG scheme <coughs> was yeah. what we did, and these are results from DG and well balanced. But so, in, in the disk case, you didn't try to. to um, not for the discontinuous disk because actually this is not a steady state. Um, yeah. <coughs> but so for this dynamic steady state, this is to approximate actually a disk. So we have uh, a conti um, just a constant density profile, but uh, we have a, a subcoplar in velocity and also the <coughs> the gravity source term. Mm -hmm. So and, and because th this doesn't have any, this doesn't have uh, th that sharp discontinuity, we can see um, the benefit. Yeah, that's. I don't know if I. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I can't change it. But th that plot uh, that I showed afterwards, you can see that you don't have these oscillations so much. Yeah. Um, I, I could have a question. What, yeah. what do you obtain if you limit, if you use a limiting uh, or limiter or something like that? Uh, mm -hmm. Which order do you get? I, I mean, what, what do you gain from using this high order method if you have to limit? quite uh, frequently. Well, so <clears throat> here you still, uh, for instance, in, the, in this case, um, you, you would, oh, actually, I think here it's better. So here the, we, we are limiting as well. But you, you still get much sharper fronts. Um, <clears throat> so it's really at, at the discontinuity you have to apply the limiter, and there you drop to first order, but this is uh, for any scheme, right? So, and uh, in the smooth regions, you, you don't have to limit. Uh, so, and the, the limiter that we use is a limiter which um, does this hierarchically, so it does some sort of shock detection and then limits if necessary. Yeah. And, but the, the real strength of this method, I believe it's more for smooth flows. Um, there, there you see, you can advect something infinitely and it's still really preserving the maximum. Is it uh, positive preserving? Like, do you have negative pressures or? Uh, so we have a limiter which does this pro positivity uh, preserving. Yeah. So it's it's not guaranteed that uh, at the shocks that we will remain uh, positive without using the the limiter. So. 